Hello YouTube and welcome to Angry Bulletins, a new series where I keep you up to date on the latest breaking events in space news that's very likely to piss you off. So smash that like, hit that subscribe, and let's get going. On April 15th, 2022, an orbiting time bomb exploded, an object cataloged as 32398 by the U.S. Space Force. This was a maneuvering thruster of sorts from a space tug that helped deliver three Russian Glosnass satellites to orbit in 2007. And what makes this especially problematic is the fact that there are dozens more of these ticking time bombs still in orbit, and the debris created by these explosions go all over the place. This particular orbit ranges anywhere from 388 kilometers from the Earth, well within the orbit of the ISS, all the way out to 19,074 kilometers. That being the case, this debris is going to be up there forever, presenting a threat not only to the ISS and other spacecraft, but to satellites as well. And the Kessler Syndrome, something that I have talked about many times becomes more and more likely every time something like this happens. So why did this thing explode in the first place? I mean, it was deployed way back in 2007. Why did it still have fuel left? Well, these motors are used to accelerate the upper stage of the proton rocket. Why does it need to accelerate? In order for it to be able to make use of its remaining fuel for secondary missions and deployment of additional satellites. After deploying its first satellite, the upper stage of the Proton, also called the DM stage, needs to relight its engine, something that's very common these days. However, that isn't as easy as just turning your car engine back on. Fuel in microgravity doesn't behave like fuel on Earth. It floats around the fuel tank without actually being conveniently at the valve at the point that you need it. So starting an engine all over again once you've exhausted the vast majority of the fuel that's in the tank is simply not going to happen unless you can find a way of getting the fuel to the valve. And the way that the Russians decided to do this is to use smaller engines that would accelerate the stage, thus pushing the fuel back towards the valve and allowing the stage to relight. This would allow the stage to exhaust the vast majority of the fuel that it has. However, the engine's themselves, these maneuvering engines, still have fuel left for years, and eventually they blow up. And when they blow up, it creates not only about a dozen or so large pieces of space debris that we can track, but also dozens if not hundreds of pieces of space debris that are still dangerous that we can't track. And what really aggravates me is the fact that this is a problem with a solution. All we need to do is simply deorbit all of these proton upper stages, and we have the technology and prototypes of satellites that would be necessary to accomplish this, but we simply don't have the funding. We're spending billions and billions of dollars on new satellite constellations, and yet virtually nothing on methods to protect these constellations from the Kessler Syndrome. But believe it or not, something good could come out of this entire fiasco. SpaceX is going to be using the same kind of principle in order to refill Starship before it makes its journey to the Moon, Mars, and other destinations throughout the solar system. SpaceX is going to have to figure out a way to make fluids behave in a way that they want them to behave during the whole refueling process. That 
isn't going to be an easy thing at all. Perhaps they could use a special configuration of these LSS maneuvering engines in order to get the fuel to where it needs to be, or perhaps they could use centrifugal force or a combination of the two. Regardless, they're going to have to figure out some sort of unique way to make fuel behave the way they want it to behave in an environment that is not very conducive to refueling or relighting engines. Refueling Starship in this uniquely challenging environment is going to be a very difficult engineering challenge to say the least. More difficult than many things that we've attempted in orbit, but I have every confidence that they can do it as long as they learn from examples like this. Oh, and also if they behave responsibly once they've completed the maneuver. In the meantime, according to an orbital debris expert at the University of Texas named Mariba Ja, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, but he has this to say about this particular crisis. Quote, In my view, this is the equivalent to passengers on the Titanic feeling that bump from an iceberg, and then there's a band playing on deck. In terms of hazardous orbital debris, things are already going a detrimental way because we haven't changed our behavior. And until that behavior does change, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>